All right, we continue now by turning to the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. The book of Esther tells one larger story. In the midst of it, um, Esther, the queen of uh, Persia, is being asked to intervene by her cousin Mordecai in a death threat against the Jews. Listen now for the word of God. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went throughout the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In, in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off the sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hatach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai and learn what was happening and why. Hatach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and entreat him for the people. Atach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Atach. Atach and gave him a message from Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called to come to the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and de deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's house will perish. Who knows? Maybe you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Friends, this is the reading and hearing of God's holy and eternal word. To God alone, we give thanks and the praise forever. Amen. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. To me, the book of Esther has always been an important book. It tells one of my top three Old Testament stories, and it contains maybe one of my top five all-time biblical quotes. It's in what Mordecai has to say to Esther as he encourages her to intervene in the danger threatening the Jewish people in the story. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this for just such a time as this. 
It's clear that it wasn't such a great time for Esther, Mordecai, and all of the Jews in the region. They had been among those who had been gathered up and exiled after the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. They had been settled, settled into the land of Persia and under the authority of the Persian king. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it was that one of the king's officials, a proud and arrogant man named Haman, liked it when people would bow in deference to his position with the king. And he didn't like it that Mordecai, because of his faith in the God of Israel, would not bow. And so he went to the Persian king and convinced him to issue a decree that on a particular day of a particular month, all of the Jews in the land of Persia were to be slaughtered and all of their goods carried off as plunder. That's the weight of the instructions that Mordecai was giving to Esther because Esther found herself in a rather unique position to help the Jewish people. Because she was both Jewish and she was the queen of all Persia. Now, that's a story in itself. But what you need to know is that the king had become dissatisfied with his previous queen. And so he had issued a decree that all of the eligible young women in the kingdom were to be gathered into his harem. And given an extended period of beauty treatments. The one of them that caught the king's eye would be made queen. Esther, a Jew living in Persia because of that exile, was among those women. And long story short, so we don't miss the parade, Esther won the king over and she became queen, placing her in a unique position to help her people in their time of crisis. In fact, Mordecai saw her becoming queen as a sign of God's provident care for the Jewish people. He saw in it an opportunity for faithfulness, and that's what he was asking Esther to see as well. And eventually, Esther did see it. And so she asked first for prayer because the thing was dangerous for reasons we're going to touch on in a few minutes. And then she went in to the king. Again, long story short, she was successful in her efforts, and the crisis facing <coughs> the Jews was averted. I make that long story short, but I think it's a story worth reading, a story worth heard and hearing. So somewhere in this Advent season, I encourage all of you to pick up your Bible and read the book of Esther. It's not particularly long. It won't take a great deal of time. But the writer has an excellent sense of dramatic <coughs> storytelling. It's a really good read, and so you should read it. Because it's a read that highlights the power of both faith and faithfulness. Faith is that thing that gives us strength to face the dark realities that surround us at times. I mean, let's be honest, none of us are, are completely happy with the current state of affairs that confront us on a daily basis. The picture that God paints for us, in terms of that scripture paints for us, in terms of God's intention for creation, doesn't always match up to the reality of the world that surrounds us. Faith gives us the power to keep moving forward in the midst of it. Faith gives us the strength to keep from falling apart. And that's where faithfulness comes in, because as we refuse to fall apart in the face of the challenges and the dangers and the struggles that confront us, as we seek to move forward in the midst of them, we recognize that God has called us to be part of what reshapes and reforms those realities into the picture that God has, that scripture paints us for, for God's intention for all of creation. This, I think, is the great power of the message that the book of Esther has to tell us. It calls us to faith. It invites us into faithfulness. And that's why I encourage you all to read it. But there's something else in this story this morning that I noticed this week. I really hadn't paid attention to it before. I'm not going to reread the whole passage to you, but there are two separate reports in the midst of it of how the people's access to their king was limited. First, when Mordecai learns what Haman wants to do in having all the, all the Jews put to death, he dons the clothing of grief. 
and he marches through this city in lament, crying out for the pain and the fear of it, demonstrating the wrongness of it. He marches right up to the palace gates, and then he stops. He goes no further. Because no one wearing the garments of grief are allowed inside the palace gates. Strange, don't you think? The people's need, the people's pain, the people's fear and brokenness are not welcome in the palace gates. The king, by law, has insulated himself from them. Doesn't make sense. Unless you've read the first chapter of the book that tells of a great party that the king throws. He invites all of his officials and the movers and shakers from all of the region. And the party goes on for 180 days. <clears throat> I'd like to be invited to that party. But it also tells us something about the king. That he's about to celebrate. He's about the rejoicing and the party. Not about the needing and the struggling and the difficulty of his people. Now, the second involves Esther herself. When she learns of what Haman's evil plot is, she wants to help. She's just not sure that she can help. Because the king has another law. No one is allowed to go into the king's presence, not even the queen, without an express invitation from the king. Anyone who enters the king's presence without invitation is to be killed immediately unless the king holds out his golden scepter to that person. That's Esther's hesitation. That's the danger that she is facing. As a Jew, she was uniquely positioned to help her fellow Jews. As queen, she was the only person who could possibly help the fellow Jews. But she needed an invitation from the king to come, and no invitation has been given. Now, what kind of king isolates himself from the pain, the need, and the struggle of his people? What kind of king closes himself off from his people so that you have to have an invitation just to be in his presence? Not any kind of king that I would want to have. I would be <coughs> The good news is we don't have that kind of king. The hope that this candle points us to, the reality that, that we are preparing to celebrate at Christmas is that our king has come and he was born in a stable, wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a cattle trough because they had nowhere else for him to sleep. This, our king, walked right up to Peter, James, and John, a bunch of dirty, smelly fishermen at the end of a very long night of fishing, and said, you three, come, follow me. This king stepped out of a boat when he was on his way to a vacation, a little R&R, &R, a break from the demands of the ministry that he had become, and was confronted with a crowd of 5,000 hungry people, and had compassion for them. This king stopped at the base of a tree where a sinner, a tax collector, was hiding and said, come down because I'm eating at your house tonight. This king stood in front of his friend's, friend's tomb and wept openly for the death of that friend. This king said to anyone who would listen, this king says to you today, come to me. You who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This king meets us at this table, like the one that he gathered with, with, with his disciples, where he took bread and blessed it and broke it and a cup and broke, blessed it and passed it to them, saying, this is me, and I'm giving it to you. Remember. And what he wanted them to remember was that he was about to give himself for them. That's the king that we light that candle for. That's the hope to which we are called in this season of Advent. That we do have a king. But not a king 
like Esther and Mordecai had to deal with. A king who has come to us to be with us. And so we do have hope. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <laughs> Gracious God, we do rejoice in your presence. We claim it out loud. You are here in our midst. When we go from this place, you will go with us. By the mystery of your power and grace, though we scatter in a hundred different directions, you go with each one of us. And you are present in every conversation that we have, in everything that we do, in all that we endeavor to be. What wonder, Lord, that you, our King, choose to rule us by simply being with us. Thank you, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.